So today I have with me Professor Adina Roskis, who is both a professor of philosophy and a neuroscientist, to talk about the mind, free will, and the nature of consciousness. Okay, Adina, so why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about what is the deal with the mind-body problem? <laughs> what is the deal with the mind-body <laughs> problem? Uh, what is the mind-body problem, I can tell you. Um, and that's really the question of how you get mind, including uh, cognition, intelligence, uh, feeling things, and what it is like to have experience. Why is there any experience at all uh, that somehow is generated by or experienced by what is essentially just a bunch of meat? You know, your brain is three pounds of meat. How in the world does it give rise to experience? That's the, that's the essential right. core of the mind-body problem. So historically, I'm sure people before Descartes was thinking, they were thinking about this, but uh, Descartes came with a very specific split, right? He did not think mind and body were the same thing. Right. Yeah, his theory is that they're two different substances or yeah, two very different kinds of uh, things or realms. Uh, the the mental and the physical, and uh, <clears throat> then the problem is how do they interact? Right, is that something called a binding problem or something like that? Uh, no, the binding problem is actually a, more a question of how do different aspects of your perceptual world come together in the right way. But this is really the, called uh, interaction. How how do these things so if the affect mind, each other? Right. Uh, yeah. So was he, was he talking about a soul as separate from the body? Descartes, yes. yes. Yeah. So Descartes' view is the soul is separate from the body. And the mind-body problem, I think, um, you know, one clear answer to it is that there's, you know, physical stuff and then there's stuff that somehow is uh, driven by God, right? Um, it's a different realm, but maybe it's the realm of the supernatural, uh, I think the, the whole problem takes on a very different kind of uh, feel to it once you give up the idea that it's the supernatural that does it and that it, and try to give an account of uh, consciousness, for instance, just in, the, in terms of natural properties. How does that happen? Yeah, I always have a problem with the idea of the supernatural interacting with the natural. Because, you know, from a physicist's perspective, right, I mean, if, if something is supernatural, it, by definition, is beyond the laws of nature, right. so to speak, right? But once you interact, you're exchanging energy, you're exchanging information somehow, so you're clearly being very physical about it. So as soon as the supernatural interacts with the natural, it becomes natural. Well, uh Yes and no, right? That I think what you could say is, well, the laws of nature are then broken by the supernatural, uh. right? So as long as you're going to hold that the laws of nature still hold, then the supernatural becomes continuous with the natural. Uh, but I think what, what people who believe in the supernatural believe is that, that those are instances where the laws of nature no longer hold. Right. It's not the case that it just happens to be parts of nature that we still don't understand, and hence we have no laws for it. Uh, right. I mean, it's more of a metaphysical claim, not that we lack the knowledge, but that there just aren't laws, or, you know, if there are laws, they're not laws of physics. Uh, to explain I those mean, things. You might say, right. well, whatever God does, it's consistent with his own laws, but he could change his mind about what the laws are at any given time or something. Right. As a physicist, I, I wouldn't think that you would countenance the supernatural anyway. Right, so, I don't. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the explanations, you know, is it doesn't even make sense from a physicist's perspective to think of something supernatural. You know, I mean, but uh, you can say that Not there are many... Not from philosophers either. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are things about nature we don't understand, and yeah. we can call them unknown things about nature. You can even argue that there are unknowable things about nature. Right. 
but that doesn't make them supernatural things. Right. And that's, so basically to wrap this up from Descartes on, you know, very few people nowadays uh, would claim that there is such a separation between uh, mind and body. Oh, I think you're wrong Oh, about good. That. Tell me then. Well, yeah. very few people or very few philosophers. Um, I, okay, I, I would... That's a very good point. <laughs> so let's split. Let's talk about the philosophers first. Yeah. yeah. I think, I would say the majority of philosophers um, are probably naturalists and they, they reject this Cartesian split. Um, okay. But there certainly are some Cartesians out there mm -hmm. in the world of philosophy and there are definitely many out there in the world. So I think most right. people uh, who don't think a lot about philosophical questions just take for granted, if they think about it at all, that there's something different about the mind and the body and the, the mental stuff, whether it's because of a soul or some other spooky property of the mental is not a natural uh, property in the same way that our bodies are physical. So, okay, so yes, yeah, so we have to talk about the public in general and the philosophers and the scientists as a separate group, so to speak. Although, of course, even within the philosophers and the scientists, you would find a minority that would still hold strong to the idea that the mind is something separate from the body. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But and, and I think that it also lines up with religion, uh, not completely across the board, but you will have a tendency to find the dualists to, to also be religious people. Yes. But so it would then, moving more to the scientific and philosophical perspective here, and not so much the religious one, so it's fair to say then that to most scientists and philosophers, mind is obviously a manifestation of what the brain is doing, and I guess the challenge is just figuring out what could that be. Right. And so do you have any sort of preferred notions about this? I know this is a completely open question and a very difficult question, but if you were to explain to someone, you know, mind is an emergent property of the brain somehow, so how would you, if that's the way to put it, how yeah. would you go ahead and do it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can do that. Um, that's a tall order. Uh, but I, I mean, I do think that that's the likely story, that there's something about the way that this physical object that's incredibly complex operates um, that generates mindedness. Uh, and it's not that hard, I mean, it's hard enough. It's hard enough to keep many scientists busy for their whole careers, but, but it's not at least conceptually that hard to think about, well, how could we explain cognition, which is, uh, you know, some kind of information processing stuff in terms of natural properties. We know how to talk about information in terms of natural properties. We know how to talk about how things are computed. Um, that doesn't go beyond, you know, as long as you think mathematics is part of the natural world, that doesn't go beyond these natural properties. Um, so I can give you a story of, for instance, how, uh, you know, I, I might be able to create a system that creates grammatically correct uh, sentences or reads words or um, can detect various kinds of objects in the environment. Um, but what I can't seem to give you a story about is why uh, something experiences things visually or why it is like anything to be the object that does these things. So we can create computers that, that do various tasks, but we don't think that computer has some experience of what it's doing. It's just crunching numbers. Right. Um, and so that's what people think of as the hard problem of consciousness, right? So we can explain various kinds of cognitive uh, abilities at least conceptually without too much problem, but, but really we have no idea how to explain why it's like anything to be uh, a cognitive agent or which, which things have those properties of, of having consciousness. So was it philosopher 
Tom Nagel that uh, wrote an essay about what is it like to be a bat or something to that matter. Yeah. Um, and that's essentially one of his arguments that, that we could not possibly imagine what it means from a cognitive perspective to be a bat or to think like a bat because we are so wired within our own perspective or our brain is so unique to ourselves, so to speak. Yeah, so the question is not what, not from the cognitive perspective. I mean, we might imagine what echolocation, the kind of information that echolocation could give us, uh, but we couldn't imagine the experience of echolocating, right. except by analogy to the experience of what we have first person experience of, which is you know vision, for instance, or mm -hmm. identifying the location of something on the basis of its sound properties or something like that. Okay, so there is a difference, a very fundamental difference between explaining how photons hit your, your eye and uh, information is propagated through your optical nerve to where your visual cortex is and then you have a bunch of neurons there that self-organize to, 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 to decodify that information and then you see something yeah. and that you can possibly replicate in a machine like you can have a robot that can see things, right? Yeah. That is very different from the subjective experience of seeing that thing right. and that's where the problem seems to lie. Right. Okay. So characterizing that subjective experience uh, and understanding what gives rise to it, what could possibly give rise to it. Um, I mean, I, I can't actually even understand what it's like to be Marcelo Gleiser, right? right? I, can, right. I can think by analogy like, well, this is how I would feel if I were Marcelo or like Marcelo, but I, I don't actually know and for all I know, you know, I look around this room and these walls look pink to me and uh, they might, you might experience them the way blue, the way I experience blue, the way blue looks to me. And I would never know and couldn't really know. It's really remarkable because anatomically at least, you know, if you look at two people's brains, right, and you dissect them, they're not that different. But something's going on there where that anatomic infrastructure, so to speak, gives rise to very different subjective experiences. I mean, I can be watching a movie and you could be watching the very same movie and we're going to react in very different ways to what we see, which possibly has something to do to your personal history and all that, but it also has something to do with your, of who you are, right? And I guess that's the fingerprint of indig individuality. Yeah, it's I mean, I, I actually think we very, we probably have very similar subjective experiences, um, but that's just on the basis of analogy, right? Logically speaking, we could have incredibly different ones. Right. My, my guess is that our brains are similar enough and things work in the same way that, that we do have similar subjective experiences. The fact that we have different reactions may have nothing to do with the subjective experience. We might just both see the movie perceptually in the same way yet interpret it very differently. Mm -hmm. And that that is going to be due to differences in our brains, which are caused by differences in our genetics as well as differences in our experience and you know our temperament, all kinds of characteristics of us. But those those characteristics, I think, have brain correlates. Yes. So somebody that sees the color red, right? I think that's the point, that you can, oh yes, the red is, is, you know, is a very particular wavelength, it has a certain frequency, and that is going to impinge an information on your head, and you can decode all that in a very physical way, I think. Yeah. But that's different from the experience of seeing red. And that's the big mystery, so to speak. Yeah. And There's so this famous philosophical argument, the Mary knowledge argument, uh, that uh, basically Frank Jackson made up this thought experiment. Like suppose there's a person, a scientist, Mary, uh, a neuroscientist. She's brilliant. She knows everything there is to know 
about color vision, but she's lived her entire life in a black and white room. Mm -hmm. And so she only has, you know, sort of declarative knowledge, book knowledge of uh, what color vision is like. And the claim is that she couldn't possibly know what it's like to see red until she leaves that room and sees red, regardless of how much information about mm. neural processing you can you give her. Right. right. Yeah, I knew that. I, I heard that one. Uh, the version I heard was with a blind person that was born blind, and then suddenly the person can mm -hmm. see. Yeah. And the same idea, right? Yeah. That experience is going to be completely new, anyways. Yeah. So, how would you then think of creating? mind artificially, you know, given this problem. You know, there's a big, big like, debate on that. Have a baby. Huh? <laughs> have a baby. That's have a baby, <laughs> right. But that's not a machine-like yeah. intelligence. And I'm thinking in terms of machine-like intelligence. You know, um, there's a huge debate out there about, you know, the naturalist that would say, to an extreme naturalist, that would say, hey, it's just a matter of how the brain is wired up. If you can simulate that in a machine, uh, complex enough, you'll be able to create some kind of mind in there yeah. that the mind will just emerge out of the, the complexity of the system, right? Yeah. And other people would say that's just nonsense, you know, that uh, you can have a bunch of switches, you know, uh, that mimic neurons, but you'll never be able to mimic the complex complexity and plasticity of a brain that generates mind. So where do you stand on that yeah. one? Well, I, it isn't clear what your question is. My, yeah. my, I'll repeat uh, it. Well, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but there <laughs> okay. are two different things in there. So there's the question of, uh, is mine nothing more than the operation of this complex, natural, you know, biological right. thing, such that if you sim simulate the organization in enough detail and capture that complexity, you can reproduce mind. Um, and then there's the question, will we ever be able to do that well enough? So mm -hmm. you might think uh, mind is nothing but that. And if you were to simul simulate it in enough detail, you would replicate mind. But we'll just never be able to do that. Um, and uh, I actually think we, we will be able to. Uh, that's, you know, I, I feel pretty. Um, convinced by the naturalistic argument, and it just follows from that that if you build a machine that has, you know, the the right bits interacting in the right way, mm -hmm. uh, you will build something that has this property of mind. That sounds good as long as you assume in the argument that you'll be able to gather all the information that is specked in a brain and reproduce it somehow artificially, yeah. right? Uh, and all the relevant information. The anyway. relevant information. We don't know what that relevant information is. Exactly. Yeah. And also, we don't know if our probing methods and tools will ever be able to unpack all of that because it's not just about where the neurons and the synaptic connections are, it's also about the flow of neurotransmitters and which ones, where and when. And so the level of complexity is not just about, it's not just like a Lego model of the brain with the little ten, you know, tentacles connecting things, it's also about how the flow of electricity and the flow of neurochemicals, which is incredibly complex, yep. and it's regulated not only by the brain, but by the rest of the body too. Like when you're scared, you know, you're going to have trigger things happen, and, and when you're hurt, you know, and so the whole, I'm just, the whole idea of having a mind without a body may be, uh, may be a mistake. Well, I don't think you can have a mind without a body because the mind needs a physical substrate Right. Um, whether that body that body could be very attenuated, but you know you've got the thing that is the mind, the brain, which is part of your body. Anyway, um, I mean that that I think is where the Cartesian and the naturalist really split, right? According to Descartes, you could have mental stuff without right. physical stuff. Yeah, and the naturalist says no, you can't. You need you need to have 
the body. So the idea then that you can build an artificial intelligence, which a, ma a machine that is an artificial intelligence, doesn't that go against the hard problem of consciousness? Because I always thought, perhaps wrongly, that what the guys that, uh, the people that believe in the hard problem of consciousness say that you just can't figure it out. We cannot figure ourselves yeah. out, so to speak. Yeah. What they are doing is they're pointing out there's a really hard problem and we don't know how to solve it. Mm -hmm. um, they're not saying you never will be able to figure it out. Some of them, the Mysterians. Yeah, say, like call him again. Yeah, you never right. will be able to figure it out. Um, but it's uh, possible that we could replicate it without figuring it out, right? Uh, so yes. that's, we yes. may not know how, how it works, uh, but if we build something with the right properties, it could still happen, huh. right? Yeah, it's a very interesting concept because, you know, most machines that we build, we have cons control over them and we sort of know every little detail. So in a sense, this would be a machine that would have properties that we cannot predict will yeah. emerge and cannot control completely. Yeah, I think most of our machines are like that, actually. It's you just do. that we don't, yeah, that they're not so complex that, you know, that the things happen all the time but you know things break down breaking down uh, yeah, or things have <coughs> bugs in them that we don't realize that they have bugs in until you know certain circumstances arise so I don't think it's true that we know everything about our machines um, and right yeah I mean if you have a motorcycle you know it's good <laughs> you know it could break in many different ways but you never well you can't predict how it's going to break but you know that when, once it breaks, you know why it's breaking. Right. And, and with this machine, the intelligence machine, I'm not quite sure that's the case. Um, no, it's true, but I mean, we're in that position now. Yeah. When the brain breaks down, we have no right. idea exactly. what's going on. Yeah, in fact, once I heard Marvin Minsky give a talk a long time ago about artificial intelligence, and, um, and I remember I was just a postdoc then, and I asked him, so does that mean that if you can't have these artificial intelligences that they'll have pathologies just like the human brain has pathologies? And then he said, oh, certainly, you know, they will get sick too. And I said, so you're going to have some sort of machine therapists, you know, yeah. to, take, to take care of these machines. And he's like, probably, you know. Um, which brings me to a question which is related to all of this, which is, so Nick Bostrom, this philosopher from Oxford, he wrote this book called Superintelligence, mm -hmm. where he is sort of cautioning us that if we build machines with intelligence, we could be in danger because these machines will very quickly become vastly more intelligent than we are, and we may become less interesting for them and, and hence obsolete. So basically he was saying uh, that, you know, it, it may be the last thing we ever build, you know, a machine that is super intelligence. That would just be the end of humanity as we know it. So what do you think of that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a possibility. Uh, I think, well, I think we have that same issue with people, right? You generate another person, they could be Mother Teresa and they could be Osama bin Laden, right? And uh, education is really important and moral education is really important. And I think if we do build intelligent machines, we should be very, very careful about uh, the kind of moral education that they get. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not sure that we're, you know, that far out of the realm of what we have already just in terms of generating other intelligences like us. Right. Um, yeah, I think their fear is that something like that, if you push it to the extreme, you know, in terms of how powerful a machine like that could be is that it would be vastly more powerful than any Osama bin Laden could be in the sense of well, I mean, controlling information flow in the world and things like that. It depends what 
it's hooked up to. Yeah. Uh, but it is true that you can get a machine to essentially read the inter you know, stuff on the internet at rates that could never be approximated by a human. So um, you certainly could get machines that have a lot more information. Now, if they use that information wisely, they could make the world a better place. Right. Um, so yeah. it depends what the motivations are of the machine, not so much its exactly. intelligence. Yeah, it right? depends I mean, what's better for them, if it's the same better for us. Yeah, I right? mean, you might think we've done the same thing to the rest of the planet, right? We think, mm -hmm. oh, we're so smart, we don't have to give moral consideration to, you know, all these other species and the mm -hmm. environment and mm -hmm. sustainability, et cetera. Um, and we may end up killing ourselves just by doing that. So you might think that a smarter machine might be more con more aware of the way that the world is intertwined. That's a good point. Um, Let's hope so, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> thing. We're far from building that machine though, yeah. at this point. So, so because we're far from building that machine, there is another way, I think, of, of thinking about our future, which is transhumanism, the idea that we may become hybrids with machines. And I, I feel like that's a tendency that is beginning already, right? With, I think a cell phone nowadays is, it's almost an extension of a person. Yeah. So much so that you forget, if you forget yours, you're sort of, you know, yourself. Have a brain. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. right? So in a, to me, that's already beginning, right? And, yeah. and I wonder if you feel like this is the trend that is more perhaps realistic in the next 20 years than having this super brain machine that is completely artificial? Uh, certainly, I think we will be more and more intertwined with our technology. Uh, there are philosophical questions about whether those pieces of technology are actually part of who we are or what our minds are. Um, I tend to be a little more skeptical about that than some people. Um, and I, I actually don't think that deciding whether or not it's part of you or just something like a prosthesis that helps you do your cognitive job better uh, really matters for the upshot, which is that, yes, we're dependent on our, on our technology. Um, I don't know whether that makes us transhuman or posthuman. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it seems like a little more sensationalism than <laughs> than, than substance. Than substance. But okay. Um, and finally, I wanted to touch on on free will. Yeah. Right. So maybe it'd be great to just start by defining what is free will. You know, for people, if if there is such a thing, or at least. Well, I think there is such a thing. I don't think it's easily defined. Okay. Um, but. Yeah, something like the ability to make one's own decisions, the ability to uh, choose what one does, uh, mm -hmm. the ability to act without coercion or uh, you know without being forced. Mm -hmm. um, so what I don't think free will is uh, is the ability to act contrary to the laws of nature. It is not that. It's not that. Right. And, um, you or know. Put it this way if that's what it is, we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Agreed. And, um, and, and on that line of reasoning, you know, at least historically, when classical physics was very, was the thing, you know, in the 19th century, when one of the problems that people had was that, look, if the universe is basically like a clockwork mechanism, and that the laws of nature can predict everything, right? Then in principle, if that's true, and if we had, I think it was Laplace that came up with a supermind yeah. analogy, right? So that if there was a supermind that had all the necessary information about the particles, where they are and their velocities, you could in principle predict every action and every behavior that possible, right? Um, so in that perspective, there wouldn't be free will, right? Because everything would be predicted. Well, I think that's them. not, yeah, I think that's not true. So the com compatibilists think that even if determinism is true, which it may not be, mm -hmm. uh, it's still possible to have free will. Um, How does that because work? Because free will doesn't depend, free will is not going against 
the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. Free will is action of a certain sort that's compatible with the laws of nature. So action on the basis of one's desires, best considered knowledge, uh, etc., volitional action uh, that goes through you know, certain kinds of pathways and not right. others. Right. Um, and so whether or not the universe is deterministic, a compatibilist says that free will is still possible and the job of the compatibilist to say, is to say what exactly is it that, that needs to be uh, the case for someone to act freely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't help you to say that the universe is indeterministic. Uh, because when we think of free will, we think of it mostly tied to the question of are people responsible for what they do? Mm -hmm. um, and so you might think, well, if you can't decide what to do or you have no choice, uh, then we're not, you're not morally responsible for what you did. If someone forces you to do something, uh, you're not responsible for what you did, right? So that would be the deterministic analog. Um, but on the other hand, if uh, your actions were just governed by a roulette wheel, uh, you again have no choice. So if indeterminism is true, then you're not morally responsible either. So whether or not physics shows that the universe is deterministic or indeterministic, it's not obvious that that's going to help you with free will. Um, yeah, I agree completely. And so the real philosophical problem is to say, well, what is it? that needs to be true for someone to act freely. And I think mm -hmm. what, it, what it is for someone to act freely is to have certain capacities, intellectual capacities, a certain kind of knowledge about what they're doing, uh, to have desires and to act in, in such a way that they use their knowledge in order to fulfill their desires and to do that without coercion. Uh, so, so provided people have the requisite capacities, I think they have free will. Okay, so those experiments that some cognitive neuroscientists have been talking about that say that the brain seems to make decisions before you are aware yeah. of, the, of those decisions and then as far as I understand the argument, which I may, may not, uh, that basically means that apparently there is no free will in that sense that uh, the brain is deciding before you know it's you yeah. made a decision. Yeah. Do those so, experiments and arguments make sense to you? I, I think the experiment, I understand the experiments. I think that they're, the interpretation of them is flawed. I don't think there are any experiments that neuroscience has done that show that we don't have free will. I think there are experiments that people have done that show that in those experiments, it's possible to uh, you know, cause people to act in ways that they are unaware of. Mm -hmm. um, so you can certainly make it the case, you can generate circumstances in which people don't act freely mm -hmm. or when they have perceptions of agency but they're mistaken about whether or not they were agential. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have the capacity for, for acting on our conscious right. beliefs and desires um, or consciously deciding what we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't yeah, I don't think there's any neuroscientific evidence that demonstrates that we don't have free will. And I can you know, we'll go through each of the experiments that yeah. claim to have done so and, and tell you why I think they fail. Right. And in an, in even, um, I agree completely, by the way, and, and even the experiments themselves, you know, I'm not an expert, but I would say that um, even the experiments they are testing something which is very different from a more complex decision at a human level, like should I get married or move to Iceland, for example, which right. is something that you're going to ponder for a long, long time. Right. There's no way you're not conscious while you're going exactly, through Exactly, right? It's yeah. not about switching, you know, am I going to go push this button or that button, you know? That is very different from a very yeah. complex, you know, emotional decision. Right. And in, at that level, I'm quite confident that we do have free will. Right. No, I, I agree. I think, you know, the laboratory experiments are, are these whittled down things where you ask people typically to decide things without any reason. 
uh, and when we care, what we care about is that we make decisions exactly. for reasons, yes. and um, that's one reason why I think you know determinism is not a, a problem if. If our decisions were unanchored from the reasons that we have, you know, causally unanchored from the reasons that we have for making them, that would be a big problem. Um, I should say, though, that there are some, there's some work in social psychology that um, bears on the extent to which we have access to the reasons for which we make decisions. And I think that actually is more of a, a threat to our notions of free will than any of the neuroscience experiments. Right, okay. Yeah, and even within the deterministic uh, reasoning, I would argue that we can't know all the laws of nature just by the way. So there's always going to be that gray zone where we really can't figure things out anyway. So free will emerges there, right, in the sense that we can't. It's not like if there is a machine, we certainly don't know how it works in its completion. You know. Com yeah, but free will isn't. I mean, it's important to distinguish ignorance or the, you know, the fact that no one has predicted what will happen from whether something is determined. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's important to distinguish determinism from something being predetermined. So I don't think it's predetermined what I'm going to do. There's nobody that, that has like made it the case that I'm about to do whatever it is I'm about to do. Uh, nonetheless, it could occur just through the action of deterministic laws. Yeah. Um, but I think that people sort of conflate like these things yeah. um, in ways that are, you know, leads to confusion. Point in case, just to, just to close this up, the idea that we live in a simulation, that we are, you know, players in a computer game that is yeah. being players no sorry we are characters in a computer right. game that is being played by some intelligence or something else which also is also Nick Bostrom's idea yeah. I guess right um, and that of course speaks directly to free will as well I think because and, and, and the matter of awareness because if we are player if we are characters in a computer computer game being played by somebody else, then our actions are being controlled by somebody else, even if we're not aware of it. Yes. Uh, if we are being controlled by, yeah, it's possible that we could be characters in a computer game that's not being controlled by anybody, right? And then, yeah. you're, then the question is, how much different is that from the, the world, and do we really not have free will? Right. Yeah. Um, this but this sort of matrix scenario. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because when you start thinking about this idea that can we be characters in a v computer game, it's really hard to prove that we can't. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not easy. That's the, that's the skeptical scenario <laughs> in the modern framework, right? I mean, right. We've, we've gone from Descartes' evil demon to, to the Matrix, but it's just a... That's true. ...a modern... Uh, ...couching of the very same worry. So the question then becomes, Let's assume we are yeah. uh, characters in a video game. Can we know we, anything? Or we don't know, but we don't know we are characters in a video game. Right. Does it matter? It's a good question. I would you know. think not really. Right. Uh, Some people say, of course it matters. We have yeah. to be free till the end. And I say, you are free because you don't know somebody's controlling you. Yeah, I'm not sure I would say because of that. Uh, but I would just say that what freedom is then in this game is the ability to, you know, act on the basis of all the mental states that you have and the knowledge that you have of the world. And if the knowledge that you have of the world is knowledge of the world in this video game, then you're free right. in this video game.